In the summer of 1999, leading Mexican television presenter and famed UFO researcher Hami Massan made a welcome return visit to Britain to appear at selected venues up and down the country as part of UFO magazine's Millennium UFO Roadshow. During a breaking proceedings, we managed to persuade Hammy to take us through some of the remarkable footage he had brought to this country, more of which you will see later in the program. Well, here we are once again for another special interview for UFO's Hard Evidence, and I can't think of a more special person to bring to this particular videotape than the one and only Hammy Massan. Hammy, terrific, of course, that you've been over here in the UK this summer attending our Millennium UFO Roadshow. What did you make of all the various venues and the people that you've met here in England and Scotland, of course? Oh, it's been an extraordinary experience. Uh, it's been a very special time for me because uh, I've been uh, really, I have received a good welcome, a lot of attention and kindness from you, your family and everybody who is around this phenomenon. I am really happy, excited to be here, especially because I think England is just starting to, to see, and Scotland, what we have been seeing in Mexico since the eclipse. And it's very coincidental that you are going to have an eclipse in the August 11th of 1999. And I think that the, the evidence shows that you are going under the same path that we observe in Mexico, especially in Mexico City. Now for the benefit of those people who are new to this subject, and there's a lot of young people out there who are just beginning to learn what a fascinating topic it is that we deal with, um, the eclipse of course that sprang Mexico to prominence occurred in July of 1991 and we have some videotape, of course, from that period. Um, what was so special about that eclipse and what was so special about the videotapes that followed? I didn't know anything about the eclipse. I just experienced, I went to an island, I saw the eclipse was beautiful, the second longest in, in, in the century. And then we had these videos with the UFOs, uh, not just in Mexico City, but also in Puebla, and in Tula, in three different cities, three different states, it seems three different UFOs. Then I started to investigate and I found that there were uh, special prophecies made more than a thousand years before this eclipse. And they were telling us, especially the Mayan prophecy that you can find at the Dresden Codex, that this eclipse could bring the end of the big lords and they would have to go and leave room for the new lords. It would be the end of the Jaguar Knights, probably the war in the world, and would be the time of the meeting with the masters of the stars. And that was amazing to me because it, it, it was a message. And if you observe the evidences and you see three different UFOs in three different cities at the same time with an incredible eclipse, you have to understand that something very special happened in Mexico that day. And the most important thing is that the Mexican people become, became aware of this phenomenon. Uh, many people started watching the skies, especially with a camera on their hands, and they were able to record in many occasions these UFOs, not just in the eclipse, but in many, many times after the eclipse. And for that reason, this eclipse became so important for Mexico. We didn't know how important until we were, we received the videos, we received the evidences. We, we knew how important it was after the eclipse. Okay, so I suppose for, for, for many, many people, um, the sight of several objects in the sky at any given time is, is considered to be amazing. But here we are in Mexico and once again we have these extraordinary images of not several UFOs, um, but numbers from... 50, 180, 100, yeah. 150. Um, I mean, it is absolutely incredible. Tell me, when we, we have this very, very rare image of um, several UFOs, it's a still photograph taken near the volcano. Was this the first occasion where more than no, one... No, no, no. 
This Same picture thing. you are seeing close to the volcano is from 1996. The first occasion was on the 27th of September 1992. Uh, uh, this man, Ulises Trujillo, was recording a long object, uh, looked like a worm or a cigar shaped object uh, standing over Mexico City. Then he realized that over his head, horizontally, horizontally, were flying at least 18 different objects. And what you can observe in this video is that they are moving along the way and they don't never lose the formation mm. they never lose the figure the shape of the figure uh, even though they move they keep that that was the first time on the 24th of october 1994 we have the second video of, from mr thomas islas and now you can see probably around 30 objects or so and they are standing still they don't move mm. and this is two o'clock in the afternoon then six it's weeks later, some, some people have suggested that these are constellations uh, in the twilight zone. <laughs> yes, yes, that's what they say. What, what can they say? You yeah. know, what can they say? This is two o'clock. This is all of these videos. If we record these videos at night, they would be stars. No question about it. Mm. I mean, at least you see 20 stars moving at the same time, but let's say they are uh, still, you, you wouldn't see them. No, the incredible thing with all these videos that we are watching now is that they were recorded uh, at daylight, mm. and that's now, very now, important. Now, now these are incredible, and you've mentioned this thing that looks almost snake-like, like organic. Now we also have a curious piece of footage taken from the space shuttle, and here we can see this thing in outer space. We're looking down on the on, on Earth, and it seems to be like a worm. Like a worm. Yeah, it moves like a worm. This was recorded on September 1991. I think was STS-48. Uh, was from the Discovery shuttle. Uh, it was releasing a satellite to measure the depletion of the ozone layer. And for, uh, for some reason, recorded this object that I believe was coming out from North America. You see the clouds under it, and you can see how this object is uh, ascending, is rising from the Earth and is going into the stratosphere. Has there been any explanation that you asked? No, none at all. That? No, yes, I have asked, but you know that. When they don't have an explanation, they just mm. keep silent, you know. Mm. What do you make of this? I mean, These are two videos that were released in 1997. The first video is from 1984. Uh, this, uh, I believe, was the Discovery Shuttle again, and they were making some reparations, fixing the satellite Palapa 22 uh, and at that moment you can see a sphere that is coming from inside the space and, you know makes some intelligent movement and goes away it's just for a few seconds but if you see this closely it, it's very clear that it's a sphere and again in uh, in 1991 from the Atlantis I don't have the number of that mission but I know was from the Atlantis you can see this sphere again move, making some intelligent movements in front of the shuttle and then going away. Yeah. But I mean, what about it looks like a fleet of spheres here in this next sequence um, viewed from the space shuttle. Has there been any explanation, official or otherwise, been put forward for this? You know, we see these spheres darting about the sky and then here we are now in the top left hand corner of the screen and there are dozens of them. Uh, NASA tr uh, yeah, this NASA is this is a video from the Mir, Mir laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, again, again, the Discovery shuttle was going close to it. Uh, we can see in the left, uh, right corner, uh, in the left upper corner of the screen, some like twenty s s things, spheres, passing by. No, there has not been a given any explanation around this. Probably you could have some because uh, as long as I have asked uh, they just smile and turn mm. around you know mm. it's the easiest way to, to not to say not to say anything when you don't have an answer mm. these are videos that don't have easy answers the name James Bond Johnson was unfamiliar to most UFO enthusiasts until only recently but the photographs which Bon Johnson took in the offices of General Roger Ramey at Fort Worth, Texas back in July 1947 are legendary. 
During a brief visit to England in 1999, we caught up with Bond Johnson at his London hotel. In this exclusive interview, we learn not only about the man and his role as the photographer who snapped pieces of an alleged UFO that crashed at Roswell, New Mexico, but how a chance meeting with a senior retired United States Air Force military figure many years later led to a claim that more than one UFO had been retrieved and stored at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Just, just a reporter. Just a reporter. Right. But I didn't, I was not officially a, a photographer. Right. I had purchased my own speed graphic and because I was, I worked odd hours as a police reporter working nights, late evening and so forth, um, I bought my own camera. I had been a uh, amateur photographer since I was a kid mm. and so I spent some of my war bonds and bought a so uh, how old would you be then? I was 21. 21? Yes. And would you say that you were um, an ambitious reporter? No, I was just working my way through college. Yeah. To, to, for what specific aim? What was your sort of career ambitions <coughs> at that time? I, uh, my first degree was in journalism and I was, after I was working there, I was planning to follow that up. Mm. And I graduated uh, from, I uh, see I started to college in the fall of 1942, right after right. Uh, I was a senior in high school when Pearl Harbor happened in December of 41, and then I finished the next summer and started into college in September. And uh, I was a year ahead uh, of my colleagues, and I would have probably stayed over and uh, gone another year to high school, except when the war started. Then. There was the urgency to for everyone to get as much education as possible. What the, the Fort Worth Star Telegram? What kind of circulation would that have had in those days? It was, was the, it, was it, it was just the largest. The it was the largest newspaper in the South. That was its in, uh, in the South of Texas. No, the South of the United States. Really? Yes. It was a morning, evening, and Sunday, and the combined circulation was the largest in the South. Now. I don't know how it compares today. Uh, uh, probably the Dallas Morning News is larger now. But it was just a morning paper. The Dallas News was a morning paper. We had a morning, afternoon, and Sunday. You see, morning, evening, and Sunday, they called it. So the combined circulation made it the largest. Uh, so you were in the offices where you when you, you, you w were told to right. get over to the, to the base. And, and what triggered that was this flash message that came from the Associated Press saying they were flying this flying saucer from Roswell to Fort Worth. Had you, prior to that, had you any indication whatsoever that anything untoward had occurred at Roswell? Had there been any any rumors, you know, on, on, the, uh, no. on, on the media grapevine? No, this was, uh, except this that This came right were, out of the blow? Yes, they were looking for, for uh, as I said, the uh, two weeks preceding, there was a front page article every day in the paper about the flying saucer incident and people were looking and they were casting about and they were reporting that they had found when one on the When we talk about the flying saucer incident, for the record, we're referring to the, the, the Kenneth Arnold incident. That, that would have which triggered. triggered all of the, yes. the, the media hype and the public attention. Yes. So I, you were familiar mm -hmm. in, in some respects with what had taken place in Washington State. Yes, that was... You, you received this flash by the Press Association. How far would the base have been from the offices of the fort? Um, it's, it's within a half hour. A half hour. And did you drive out there? Yes. What was your car? <laughs> this is for the car enthusiasts. <laughs> was it a Buick? I had a, or? Brand, I had a <laughs> brand new 1947 Ford Club Coupe yeah. with, uh, that I paid fifteen ninety four twenty one for <laughs> American. <laughs> And uh, with including a signal seeker radio and seat covers. <laughs> what else do you want to know? But I was very proud of that car, and I got it through the Star Telegram in 1947. I'd been on waiting lists. See, I came home from the war at the end of '45, and I had sold my car uh, when I went in service, and so I was uh, riding in cabs and. Um, fortunately, our newspaper owner also owned the Yellow Cab Company, so that made it easy to get about. But uh, I wanted my own car, and I'd been on waiting lists. You signed up at different places and would put down a deposit, 
and uh, wait for a car. Who was your immediate boss or your supervisor? Mm -hmm. His or name or was Cullum Green, was my city editor, and he's the one that came over and said, yeah. Bon, okay, you I have your like camera, you. because see, I was not normal. Yeah. And, yeah, I said, it's out in the car. I kept it in the trunk of the car. And he said, well, go out to General Ramey's office, and uh, they're bringing in a flying saucer. And did you say Brussels. what? <laughs> no, because this was... Uh, everybody was expecting that sooner or later somebody would come up with one if they're out there and yeah. now they've captured one and they're bringing it to and that was a logical thing because this yeah. was eight to, uh, the headquarters of the but, Air Force. But here you are, you, you, you're, you're in your vehicle, you've got a 30 minute drive or so to the base, you've been sent by the city editor, you're 22 years of age, 21, 21 years of age and you're on the brink of potentially the most important news announcement or discovery on the history of the planet. I mean, what yeah, that was, didn't what, that did, didn't compute. What, that was not. Okay. It was not that. And, and I've been. Uh, this is the thing you say. I mean, what was going through your mind on that journey from your newspaper right. desk to Fort Worth? Uh -huh. I don't have. About, did you have any kind of idea as to what you might expect? <coughs> Were you going to be taken to a hangar? Were you going to meet anybody? Were you going to see anything? What was going through your mind? I had been involved in some airplane crashes before. And in every case, in the past, they had reassembled these in hangars. That was kind of the MO as it is today. That's sure. what you, uh, with the Pan Am uh, crash and so forth, sure. they always seemed to find an empty hangar somewhere and reconstruct it to try to find out what happened. That was what I would have expected, <clears throat> and I still remember, I remember only a few incidents. You know, our, mm. our memory, I think, could be described as being in sound bites. Sure. That is but, what we just remember, but, little snippets of a uh, of thing, and, but there are the few snippets that I have of that day. So you, you, you arrive at the base. Right. Are you not then surprised to be taken, instead of a hangar or an area where, right. like you say, you might expect to see something that has been assembled from the wreckage and the like, but instead to, to a carpeted office. That's correct. General. That did not make sense. Why would, and it doesn't to this moment. You've literally entered this room, you've seen the carpet. What was it about that room that you looked at? What, what happened next? Basically? I remember my consternation, the fact that um, here was this junk piled on the floor, not very photographic or photogenic at all. Um, and now I've got a, you know, this is one of my uh, really, I guess, first assignments. I had only had the camera for a month or two. And um, so this was really one of the first times that I had been assigned to do it. Otherwise, I had gone like covering a, a speaking engagement or something, and you take a headshot of the a speaker, that kind of a thing, or a handshake uh, kind of a picture of two people, which you get a lot of on a newspaper. And here was the first time that it was really a spot news assignment. And it was so, I can remember being disappointed and frustrated because it was so unphotogenic. Did you say that to anybody who might have been with you in the room at that time? When you first went think, in? No, I think that was my own private thought. Was there anybody else in there? Were you I don't recall there? the... I recall uh, Colonel DeBose. Prior Debose. to General <coughs> Ramey arriving. Right. The, the Colonel DeBose met me mm. and uh, he was expecting the general momentarily mm. and he went off to, uh, to look for him. I don't have a clear recollection of Marcel at all. That's just not a part of it. Were there any MPs there? No, there was no security. There was no, uh, no more than there is in this room at this moment. It was just you just go in and you wait, and uh, the general will be here in a minute. And no other photo journalists with you at that moment? None. I do not recall. Another time, I worked five years on the Star Telegram with the interruption for the war. Um, <clears throat> I do not recall another instance where they sent over the wire photo equipment to transmit. Mm. Um, so, so that was just a very extraordinary situation for yeah. us, too. So we, we received but didn't transmit. Yeah. So you, you've, you've had your first look inside this room. Right. Um, were any of these parcels that you described in, in meat wrapping paper, were any open at that point? Yes, there was, uh, the, the, what we see in the, in the pictures, 
the large part of the paper was already unwrapped and those large sections were were there but not laid out. I arranged them to try to pose a picture. <clears throat> it was just kind of piled up. It would be like, uh, as I remember, putting a kite together when you would buy a kite and the sticks and it would be in a roll, rolled up together. It was kind of like that and you lay it, you know, how you unwrap a kite with the sticks and to uh, make it so it will fly. And it was well, kind of that drill. Were you particularly careful how you handled that no. debris at all? No. This was simply a case of, I've got to take a photo of this, let's, let's do it. And, and l try to make something mm. photogenic out of it. Yeah. And, and like it, because it was all blackened, uh, uh, burned looking stuff, and there was not much contrast as, it, as the pictures show. Yeah, and also it smelled. <coughs> it was, was smelly. Was that the smell that, that was there as soon as you entered the room? Yes, it was, and that's what struck me as, as unusual, why that this smelly junk would be piled on the general's carpet. That was one of the few recollections that I have uh, that didn't make sense. There was no one to discuss this with, there were no other media people, there were no, I was just there and it was, we were not expecting, I was not sent there as a reporter and Phil Klass has beat me over the head with this again and again and again saying, surely you were aware, the question you said well ago, Surely you were aware of the importance of this moment. And this was no, it was not that at all. This was a photo assignment. It was a get you out had there a deadline. And to, it was to the be. time yeah. was the urgency. We're we're on the East Coast deadline. You know, get out there, get it, get back here, there, and let's get this. So it was the urgency okay. of the situation. Did Colonel Debose come in with General Ramey? Yes. They both came in together. The general came in first. Did uh, did, did he acknowledge you at all? I knew him because I was the military reporter and I had seen him, uh, I'd been there, had taken his picture just a few weeks before when uh, General McMullen was there, his boss, <coughs> and Ramey had just taken over the command from McMullen. McMullen had moved on up the tape and had gone to Washington. Uh, they had just formed the up the 8th Air Force with McMullen in command and Ramey as his deputy. <coughs> And then McMullen was reassigned to Washington, and and Ramey took over uh, just a few weeks before that. And I remember um, covering a part of that. Did Ramey come in with? Was there anybody else that came in with Ramey? Is adjutant or, or, or any his, sidekicks at all? Yes, uh, Dubose was his chief of well, staff. Well, apart from Dubose, yeah, I was yes. basically meaning. And if there were any others, I don't recall them. Hmm. And he could have, you know. Were there any words exchanged at all? The only thing I recall was asking him, you know, what is this? And he kind of shrugged and said, damned if I know, or something like that. What was it that led to this remarkable statement, if you like, or, or response from the general, or the, the brigadier, I beg your pardon, um, in respect of wreckage, Let, let's, can we can we look at that? Yes, what we led talked to this. Uh, um, that was just an incidental statement when I said, "Did you see the wreckage?" Because he was the commanding general at Wright Pat along with his career. I said, "Did you ever see it?" Because they talk about it being in Hangar 18 or whatever it is, uh, and I said, "He said," he, and he corrected me and said, "Wreckages." And I said, oh, more than one? He said, yes, we had more than one there. And uh, that was surprising to me. I didn't, didn't know about that. But I've since read about confirmation of that from other sources. That, mm. that Roswell is just one of several that they've captured along the way. The last edition of UFO's Hard Evidence, new and outstanding UFO footage has come our way from a variety of sources. The task of analysing UFO images falls to UFO magazine's Russell Callahan, who literally can spend hours delving over single frames in our quest for answers. Here, Russell expands on some of the most puzzling and striking images that have crossed his desk in recent months. Hi there, my name's Russell Callaghan, and I'm sure over the past few years some of us have actually met face to face, and in the making of UFO's hard evidence, um, we've covered incidents that's affected people's lives, people like yourself. It's been a privilege working alongside UFO magazine, who 
are very professional in the approach to publishing material that's not always too easy to accept. The mainstream media don't want really to, to get too involved with the subject. They'll take a fleeting glance at footage and they'll put footage out on, on the six o'clock news or something like that and once it's seen it's gone, never to be seen again. Places like local television stations, local news magazine programs, they take footage from people as a curiosity item if you like on, on the running order and that's literally all it's ever been. With UFOs Hard Evidence we, we've tried to expand on the subject, on what people are seeing, on what people are feeling and, and how people are actually relating to the events that, that happen and sometimes get caught on camera. Um, I have a background in television over 20 years and I've seen equipment advance rapidly over the last five or six years and it's these advances that, that have made it possible for us to bring UFOs hard evidence to you in a format that's quite professional looks like a television program that's what we're trying to do we're not trying to emulate the X-Files or some big documentary that may be screened on the Discovery Channel or something like that the budget just doesn't allow what we do try to do is get out there meet the people who, who matter and bring their stories to people like you. The enthusiasts, the researchers, people who are wanting to learn more and more about this subject. Um, I'm also responsible for the website and this has proven a great tool for us here at the magazine for the simple reason the magazine's a bi-monthly publication and breaking stories can sometimes be six and seven weeks old before they actually hit the newsstand on the magazine. So it's a privilege to have a tool like the internet where we can get things out there instantly if you like. I, I can update fr from my desk here at UFO magazine. I can get the information out published on the web in a matter of minutes and it's bearing fruit. We, we've started just recently logging on to reports from, from local groups, from individuals and being able to link to the local groups websites and to be able to get the information straight to the researchers, straight to the reporters and as we say bearing fruit in the sense that other groups who have had similar reports at the same time or on the same night or on the same day uh, are able to compare notes and it's compiling the evidence and, and that's what UFO's hard evidence is all about. It's about presenting material that's not too easy to just discard. Now the footage you see now um, came from a gentleman called Chris Martin. Chris has had several experiences in his life and has been fortunate to record things that he couldn't rightly explain. The hell is that? Uh, and this time I, I think he, he sort of struck the jackpot. Uh, he lives in London and he was filming in broad daylight and we can see the panorama shows Crystal Palace there in the background and Canary Wharf we can see many famous landmarks and all of a sudden we see this sphere, a round object, something that's not too easy to, to mistake as an aircraft or a helicopter or, or landing lights or a bird or a balloon. As our friend Hamid Massan pointed that's out me. earlier on, spheres have been reported I don't know what it is, in what numbers there. since 1991, since the eclipse over Mexico City. And they have got hundreds and hundreds go. of hours of similar footage. But this one, as you can see, seems to be probably the best sphere footage we've ever seen in this country. And, and it's flying over, over London, over the centre Ooh, of a major capital of the world. Let's not forget, we've got Heathrow Airport on one side, we've got Gatwick away to another, we've got the London City Airport. The skies above London are some of the busiest fast, yeah. skies in the world. And this thing just seems to be meandering across the skies performing manoeuvres that don't seem normal for, for aircraft. Um, certainly I wouldn't want to be eating my packed lunch on, a, on an aeroplane doing these sort of manoeuvres. And when it comes to analysis, all we can do is discard this as being anything as normal aircraft. And, and as you can see as we watch again, this thing was viewed for several minutes. But what's interesting about footage like Chris's there it's it not just a fleeting glance, it's not something that somebody's captured in an instant. Uh, there it is, the tape arrives and 
the footage has started recording with the object there and it, it ends before the object goes anywhere. We're just seeing the focal object on the screen for a short brief period of time. In Chris's case, we see the object come into view and we see the object go out of view. As we pointed out with um, Brian McPhee's footage from, from Stirling in Scotland on the last uh, volume of Hard Evidence, Hard Evidence 3, this guy filmed some amazing stuff and just a quick reminder here, we can see the clips very similar to the manoeuvres we're seeing in Chris Martin's footage and we, we've got to say that these are two of the same thing and I certainly don't think in this case that we're watching aircraft, even military performing manoeuvres they don't do this over London for goodness sake, can you imagine a high powered jet over London and something going wrong it will be absolute carnage and again back to Brian McPhee this guy spent a lot of time behind the camera he's, he's had a lot of patience and he sat there and he's filmed for hours and hours and hours and some instances he didn't actually know if he'd recorded anything until he manages to get home and sit and re-watch again for hours and hours and hours over viewing the footage checking every single frame and it again bore fruit um, Brian has filmed some remarkable objects as we saw in Hard Evidence 3 but this time the object that Brian filmed was something a little bit special let's watch it's very quick and the objects flying over his house and all of a sudden it appears to split in two now that's not military that's not civil aviation um, where does it go if we see the split we can slow it right down for you and you can see in slow motion that this thing does seem to separate um, but the second object appears to go nowhere it's there for just about five or six frames and then it's gone now it's evidence like this it's videos like this that, that we need people to see hence the reason for, for putting it on hard evidence um, it's the only tool we've got is UFOs hard evidence to guarantee that the footage will go out in its entirety. Um, I can't understand why television news companies and documentary makers tend to steer away from this sort of footage because believe you me this is riveting. Again let's just watch as, as, as the object splits in two. I can't explain that. In analysing the footage all we can say is that this is something that's not normal. This is something that is very very difficult to explain. We've shown this footage um, to our friends at the local airport and they come up with the same answers. Uh, what is it? We don't know. Um, but Brian and people like Chris Martin are there, keep filming these objects. I wouldn't say it was a very easy thing to uh, fake. Let's face it, if you were going to fake something, you'd fake something that looked like a UFO. But you know, one of my theories are over the last 50 years, some of the earliest footage recorded on film, 16mm film, the Tremerton film, and we'll just have a quick look at it here in the background. Round spherical objects, balls of light, self-luminescent, they've been filmed for 50 years. This is not a new phenomena. This is something that even the US military, in their terminology, um, in the press statement for, for the release of, of this material back in the 50s referred to them as self-fluorescent spheres a term that Hammy Massans captured um, and clung to for, for describing the, the sightings over Mexico City and just to finish off um, this one well maybe we can't call it a sphere as such but just watch this this is stock footage of a, a B2 the stealth bomber as it takes off and look look what happens behind it we see one of these glowing particles whether it's a sphere or not I don't know this one needs a lot more time spending on it even though it's only a brief clip we have got to find out exactly where this footage was filmed and, and who took it but watch again there we have B2 the America's most expensive aeroplane one of the most expensive flying machines ever ever built and clear as day it's been followed by an unidentified flying object
Bird is not only one of Britain's most accomplished and articulate UFO researchers, but thanks to his literary prowess, he's gained a much-deserved worldwide reputation for uncovering facts that most UFO skeptics and debunkers struggle to counter. In this exclusive interview, Nicholas talks about one of the cases he chose to investigate for his sensational new book, Cosmic Crashes. One of the most contentious stories concerning crashed UFOs in general, and certainly in Britain, are the allegations surrounding this Berwyn Mountain incident in January 74. Now, I wrote a chapter in Covert Agenda concerning the claims of um, that something had impacted on the Berwyn Mountains in January 74, that strange helicopters, unmarked helicopters, strange lights were seen around the country in the same time frame, um, that there was a high level military involvement, that some form of object had possibly been retrieved, and so on. Well, I concluded the writing for Covert Agenda in around about the end of 95, despite the fact that the book didn't come out till 97. But in the intervening year, 1996, Tony Dodd surfaced with this story, allegedly coming from a retired British Army guy given the pseudonym of James Prescott, stating that he was involved in the retrieval or the transportation of alien bodies from the Berwyn Mountain site to the chemical and biological research establishment at Porton Down. Now this without doubt is a, an extremely controversial story, there's no getting away from that and I think I would not deny that in recent months, particularly Andy Roberts has done a lot of in-depth research and personally, and I, I've told Andy this, I'm personally convinced that he has without any shadow of a doubt answered some of the more controversial claims surrounding that particular incident. I'm absolutely convinced of that. But there is still the problem of this guy who surfaced. Now, when I was doing the research for Cosmic Crashes, um, I spoke and interviewed a lot of people who may have had involvement, not in the case, but researching it and so on, just to get their perspectives. Margaret Fry, Jenny Randalls, Matthew Williams, Andy, and people like that. And what's in particular turned out, or what I found, was the fact that this guy, James Prescott, I can't confirm that the guy exists. Matthew, Jenny, Andy, none of them have been able to confirm he exists. None of them have been able to get past Tony, so to speak, to try and determine who he is and so forth. But when I, I did some filming at the Public Record Office in 1996 for a BBC documentary called Out of This World, and shortly afterwards I was contacted by a guy, a very credible guy it turns out, who used to work for ATV television, it's now Central Television, when it was in ATV in the 1970s. And in January 1974, he was part of a news team which would do outside broadcast, you know, if there'd been a, a car smash on the M6 or something, they'd go out there, or a bank raid, something like that. And he told me that they'd received a report of a fairly interesting UFO incident which had occurred um, in the Hensford area of Cannock Chase on a particular night in January 1974. Now for those who aren't aware Cannock Chase is sort of a huge literally massive sprawling forest area in uh, Staffordshire. Well he told me that he couldn't remember the details of how they determined the exact location but it was in the Hensford area of Cannock Chase which is sort of in the thick part of the forest. They managed to get out there, it was snowing that night, um, when they got out to the particular site they found two guys sitting by the edge of a field in a car, an old A40 car I think it was, and no less than about 10 troop carriers, army uh, lorries, with about 100 or so troops milling around, basically all hell breaking loose. And the gist of the story was, these two guys had seen what they initially thought was a plane coming down um, in a field. It looked like a fireball, something trailing behind it. When they pulled up and managed to get out to the field, they described, as, described it as a flying saucer. Now, when I pressed the, the ATV guy, he said that was literally the description they gave, a flying saucer. Well, the ATV team pulled up at the field. Um, army was milling around, wouldn't allow them in the field. Um, wouldn't allow them basically to do anything 
Um, but they just said we're a, like a Vox Pop team, as he described it from ATV. A what? Vox Pop. It's uh, sort of an outside broadcast term that they, they use. And um, they did a small interview with the driver who seemed to be very, very ill, he was sweating. he just got shirt sleeves on, yet it was throwing down with snow. Now, when they'd done the interview, one of the, the cameramen, when they'd gone back to the van, the cameraman um, actually snuck out the back of the van and sort of did a detour, quite a long detour around, and went into the field from the reverse side, got into the field and found a huge circular burn mark within the field. Now, he got this down on tape, or on um, the ancient equivalent of videotape, whatever they had at the time, and they took it back to the studios. Now, the following day, he said people came in from the home office and removed the film. Now, that in itself sounds like an x file ish type scenario, but he was able to sh present to me evidence showing he worked at ATV. He named all the people involved in the crew, um, I know their names, I know where some of them work, some of them are overseas now, but they, they were working for ATV at the time. He went on to work on a number of well-known films afterwards, including, including uh, Raise the Titanic, McVicar, and then he went over to the States to work as well. But what's interesting is that if you tie this in with the story that Tony relates concerning James Prescott, well, in the Berwyn Mountains case, and in this Canuck Chase story as well, you've got military presence at two fairly spectacular alleged UFO sites in Britain in 1974, both in January 74. Now, in the Berwyn case, we know from the testimony of some of the people involved that there was a fall of snow that night. In the Staffordshire case, the witness told me that it was snowing heavily. So. My implication what you're saying is it, it may well have been the same camera guy couldn't exactly pinpoint the day no but it's entirely possible given that it was definitely january 74 and it was snowing on the Berwyn location it was snowing in the staffordshire location this could well have occurred at the same in the same time frame now in tony's accounts oh sorry in james prescott's account that he gave to tony he said that his um, unit were based down south in the south part of england somewhere um, but they received, and this is the bizarre aspect of the case, they received advance notice that they were going to be required um, to take part in some form of operation. And he said on the specific night in question, they headed north up towards Birmingham. Now Birmingham is a stone's throw away from Cannock Chase. So it's entirely possible that if Tony's witness is being truthful and honest, that the, the team that uh, eventually made its way to North Wales was the very same one seen swarming over the chase. Now, given the fact that Tony Saw said they had prior notice that they were going to be required, when I spoke with the ATV guy, he told me that the incident at Cannock Chase hadn't been reported by the two guys in the car because they were just sat there in shock, basically. So I said, well, how do you explain that then? He, and his opinion or his conclusion was that the army again had got advance notice that this was going to take place, um, which would allow them to get to the scene in time um, to take charge of whatever went on. So again, you've got another parallel there, the fact that you know James Prescott is saying that he had advance notice, this guy is saying that at Cannock Chase the army were already there ready and prepared to take um, charge of the situation. Now in addition to that, when I interviewed Jenny Randalls uh, with regard to the Berwyn allegations and so on, she told me that she'd been lecturing at the Unconvention, the 14 Times Unconvention in 95, and was approached by a journalist, a science journalist on a National Sunday newspaper, who said that um, he'd been doing some research for a story concerning um, quite an alarming raise in childhood cancers in the area. Now. The guy from um, the, the Cannock Chase case, the ATV guy, he told me that one of the two guys um, in the car who saw this UFO come down and actually went out towards it suffered radiation burns and actually died very, very quickly afterwards from his injuries. And I've been looking into the allegations concerning where he was taken, uh, where he died and so on, and I've literally hit a brick wall, not because... Um, I can't track people down, but because everyone I'm tracking down has really clammed up, and I don't mean just slightly, I mean 
almost to a level of fear being expressed, shall we say. Course of the last few months, UFO magazine has helped to disseminate striking new UFO images gleaned from space via NASA's own space shuttle transmissions. Most may have seen example of these in our specially produced videotape, The Secret NASA Transmissions. But now, thanks to Hami Musan, two striking new sequences have come to light. What might the debunkers make of this object as it descends through Earth's atmosphere? Notice that the object appears to cut through the atmosphere with little evidence of burn-up. And if there was the slightest suspicion that the mysterious object may have been an ice crystal, think again. Just watch how the cameraman on board the space shuttle follows the object as it picks up speed high above Earth's atmosphere. Even when the sequence is slowed down, the amazing speed of this unidentified flying object is apparent for all to see. Most UFO enthusiasts are by now familiar with the extraordinary footage of mysterious spheres seen hovering and manoeuvring around the Mir space station and STS-84. Skeptics, debunkers and even NASA themselves maintain that these are nothing more than ice crystals. But now look at this amateur camcorder footage taken by an anonymous scientist from within the Russian Space Center headquarters itself. Look at the displays, they are genuine enough. Now look at the giant TV screen which shows the Mir space station apparently surrounded by a group of static spheres while others pass by from different directions. These are incredible images that defy all logic and convention. Truth can indeed be sometimes stranger than fiction. Edgar Mitchell was the sixth man to walk on the moon. In recent years, he's championed the UFO cause by proclaiming that extraterrestrials are real and not imagined, that UFOs have been retrieved and their technologies put to use. In this exclusive interview, Mitchell expands on his reasoning with Hami Massan and reaches some profound conclusions. There is a new reality, a reality that hasn't been accepted by science. The possibility of, of uh, in the air to be visited by some other intelligence. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Well, let's, let's break that issue into two parts. Uh, until the last 20 years, both in science and in theology, the idea that we were alone in the universe was the prevalent conventional wisdom. It was even stated at the beginning of the space age by the British astronomer Fred Hoyle, who said Copernicus disabused us of the idea 500 years ago that we were the geometric center of the universe, but we still insist on believing we're the biological center of the universe. When I went to the moon in 1971, it was still conventional wisdom, both in science and in theology, that we were the biological center of the universe. No one believes that anymore. The model that I propose, which I call my dietic model, in which I write about in my book, The Way of the Explorer, <clears throat> says 
suggests that there is that life in the universe is evolved everywhere that environmental conditions permitted <clears throat> which means that life could have been somewhere even in our galaxy a billion or so years before us possible and there will be life forming in the universe a billion years after us or longer <clears throat> the question is have they found us we haven't found them yet <laughs> but have they found us mathematical studies of the size of the universe and the ability to evolve and travel the universe suggested any civilization 500 million years older than ours could very well have traveled through the universe and found us. So, it is a possibility. Now the question, have they? There is no, what I call, smoking gun evidence in the public domain that says yes. But we have an enormous amount of anomaly, so-called UFO sightings. We have a great deal of circumstantial evidence that says we have been visited and that the official agencies responsible for investigating this have covered it up. I have no first-hand experience here. The what experience I do have is talking with people in the American government, both in the military and in intelligence whose official duties were a part of the investigation and they say yes what our current effort is involved with is to get these people who have had experience over the last 30 or 40 years with these events to be able to come forward and speak openly before our Congress about what they did and what they know and what their experience was. All of these people operated under high security clearance and were not permitted officially at the time to talk about what was going on. It is now time to do that. And so our effort, mine and those of many of my colleagues, is to get this knowledge, whatever it is, made available to the public. Uh, it's not a simple phenomenon we're dealing with here. Personally, I think that the evidence says yes, but it even more than that, I think the evidence says these, that alien technology has been utilized by people on Earth, and that perhaps many of the sightings that people around the world are making now are not due to alien technology, to aliens, but to humans using an alien technology. That seems to be where the evidence points right now. Can I prove that? Can I confirm that? No. But the evidence is becoming so overwhelming. We also know, and I work with very high level people who do know, we don't have those types of technologies in earthbound arsenal, military. They don't have it. So where's it coming from? Who has it? Uh, and it's not apparently all alien. It, there is reason to believe that some technology has been utilized by perhaps government and military people. On the other hand, our current government and military is totally naive about this. In other words, it's been separated away from government. And that's very alarming. Why do you think this reality was uh, separated from the people? <clears throat> Historically, it goes back to shortly after World War II. And if there were, and I say if, there were was a crash at Roswell, New Mexico, as claimed. Uh, the evidence seemed to suggest there was. Then there was reason, probably, for the government to classify this very highly. People would be afraid. 
the military would have to admit we can't defend against alien presence and there needed time to think about it and to decide what to do. But as often happens when you classify secret or very high secret classifications, very soon uh, politicians and temporary people in government aren't considered reliable enough to have that information. So suddenly they're excluded from the information and it becomes a very tight group of people who have the knowledge and all of a sudden power exerts itself. That seems to have happened and it seems that about 30 years ago high-level politicians, leadership, presidents, high-level military officer no longer were given access to the information and it became a clandestine group. That seems to be what's happened and if so it's very dangerous because no government of the world has control of it. Not even the US. We blame the US government but I know the US government leadership is naive. They do not know. But somebody, something's happening here. Someone knows. Someone is doing this. And I don't believe it's all ET. And now, here's a selected sample of some of the latest UFO images gleaned from around the world.
Riccardo Balducci is a leading Vatican official who has sprung to prominence in recent times with his outspoken views on the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Like Edgar Mitchell before him, Balducci believes that UFOs and extraterrestrials are real. Intriguingly, Father Balducci has not been rebuked by the Vatican for professing such controversial opinions. Instead, it would appear he has their full support. Leading German UFO researcher Michael Hessemann managed to catch up with Balducci while attending a UFO conference in Italy earlier this year. See what you make of Corrado Balducci in this rare and exclusive interview. Who believe in the existence of um, extraterrestrial or is there any conflict with the state? No, no, there is not any conflict. It's understandable to believe in them. And nowadays, at this very point, and this is valid for every one of us, it's necessary to accept that there is some reality behind extraterrestrials and the flying saucers, behind the so-called ufology in a general sense. And we should believe, and not only because of faith, I mean, we should not deny the existence of this phenomenon and of course its implications and this is because there are already so many witnesses today maybe thousands of them, thousands of witnesses and for that to deny systematically and giving to all of this this sense of suggestions to frauds or wealth insanity is not fair. By doing so would mean to destroy the value of human testimony and the fact of the existence of other beings and the kind of beings they could be may be lower than us in nature or well, beings of the same nature than us, beings like ourselves, or well, superior beings. And all of this is possible, all the three choices are possible. And everything I just said is not against the religious teachings. The head of all the universe, even with extraterrestrials, even with uh, this so-called bios of flying saucers, the UFOs and so on. The head of all of these things is always Jesus because he is the king of the universe and then when science will be able to give scientific proof of the re real nature of these beings that are extraterrestrial and when obviously these contacts will become more frequent and also more divulgated to all of us not only the fact of the contact itself but also letting us know the nature of these extraterrestrial beings then it's obvious that the church will know how to conciliate with no doubt its statements of today referred only to our days to the beings we are from centuries or well millenniums human beings that we are maybe from thousands of millennium with the time that will be conciliated all the truths that today are limited for our human understanding on the 23rd of july this summer russell callahan and graham birdsell traveled to visit RAF fairford in gloucestershire england to preview this year's royal international air to two they had the good fortune to be present, along with the rest of the world's press, to see the arrival of the fabled B-2 stealth bomber. Not only that, but they later managed to conduct a brief interview with no less a person than the pilot of the B-2 himself. It was an extraordinary day, which began with the arrival overhead of this equally extraordinary aircraft.
An air refuel over here, was it just one? We had two. We had two. We had two just so that we, we didn't need to, but the second one we we didn't want to have to worry with the fuel in here on the field, so we pumped it up yeah. really full here, and now they can fly and take off and head home without having to refuel it. It's a big step up from an F-16 to a B-2. It is. Um, was that something that you selected to do? I did. I applied for the job. Uh, <laughs> the job is still a by application and selection process. Uh, all the records are reviewed by the wing commander on base, and he makes the final selection of who comes to fly it. Uh, we certainly, at this stage of the game, don't need anybody who, who doesn't want to be there for starters. And, uh, and we certainly, with this type of airframe, need the guys who are a little bit above their peers in a performance stage. Yeah. I was interested to hear you talk about the new technologies. This plane was rolled out at Palmdale, California, 10 years ago. It was. Um, how long do you think it will be before we're on to the next stage of stealth aircraft? And we're all here. Will it be another 10 years before we're looking at something even well, more bizarre, or, or well, what do you think? This is, a, this is air, air vehicle number three. It was built in 1982, hmm. so uh, it was built a lot more than 10 years ago. But if you took that plane then, when it was rolled out, and what it is now, it's a totally different airplane. As we've sent them back and started with our Block 10 training sort, training aircraft, and went to our Block 20 limited weapons employment aircraft, to our final our final uh, full operational capable aircraft, they go back to Palmdale and they get totally stripped out. It's a totally different airplane. So as technology has advanced, the airplane has kept up with that advancement. Because you, you'll appreciate where my question is coming from. Um, there's all kinds of weird and wonderful rumors coming out of Nevada and California about yes, the next are. generation yes, and uh, <laughs> do you ever hope to fly one of these things if they exist? It would be great. <laughs> it would Thank be you. Great. Astonishing stories, incredible images, fascinating revelations. They endear themselves to one of the world's greatest mysteries. But in the past couple of years, the layers that have protected this mystery for decade upon decade have begun to be peeled away. The evidence is indeed overwhelming, but then we already knew that. But perhaps it wasn't enough. Perhaps more information, more evidence was required to make the world's media sit up and pay even closer attention to what is occurring around us. We will continue to assist toward that goal. The truth is out there. And it's only a matter of time before we see that truth shared with the rest of the world. We trust that you've enjoyed watching this special edition of UFO's Hard Evidence and hope to have the pleasure of your company again in the not too distant future. Until the next time, we thank you for your continued support.